you, baby. Ah, 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 yeah. I feel the earth move under my feet. I feel the sky tumbling down, tumbling down. I feel the earth move under my feet. I feel the sky tumbling down, tumbling down, tumbling down, tumbling down. It's not the pale moon that excites me. I have one more song for you, then I'd like to welcome Tequila on the stage. <laughs> you 
Intercultural Education here at Denison, and welcome to Denison's 2018 Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration um, key event, keynote event. I think we're all in for a real treat today. It's great to see so many people come out, um, and I want to just welcome you, and especially our guests. I also want to give a few brief announcements. Um, there are a number of people to thank for making this possible this weekend and today. Um, there's a list in your program. Please take a look at that. I won't take the time to read everybody off here, but I want to give a special thank you to Phoebe Myram, our chaplain, who really had a vision for this day um, and really was instrumental in helping put this all together. So thank you to Phoebe. This is not the end of the celebration. Um, afterwards, there will be a whole nother round of workshops. I think there's about eight at 3.30 or 15 minutes after this event, whichever is later. So you don't have to rush out if we're running a little over. There'll be a 15 minute break between this event and the next round of workshops. I encourage you to look in your program and attend those. Also, there are some exhibits coming to campus in the next few weeks related to this celebration and some um, curator and artist events, um, talks. So please, again, those are listed in the program and we invite you to attend those as well. Um, please turn off your cell phones and all <laughs> so we don't have ringing in the middle of the, 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 the talk in the panel. Um, 
And finally, I regret to let you know that Jackie Lewis is ill and will not be able to enjoy, join us today, but she has promised that she will come to campus and we'll be sure to let everybody know whenever we reschedule that. That being said, we still have a great panel and um, I think you will not notice her loss as much as, as uh, in today's events. Um, so that being said, I don't think you really want to hear me talk. <laughs> so I want to invite um, our 20th president, uh, who has been a big supporter of these events, um, has helped fund these events, and has just encouraged um, all of the conversation we have on campus around uh, celebrating difference, respecting um, our different backgrounds and um, abilities and all that we bring to campus from all over the globe. And um, so I would like to call Adam Weinberg, President Adam Weinberg up to introduce our speaker today. So how about just a huge shout out for Rachel and for Tehila for those wonderful performances. I am neither as um, talented or poised as they are up on the, on the stage. MLK Day is always an important day at Denison. Um, each year we try and do something a little different that engages our community in the spirit of Dr. King and that challenges us as human beings. In my view, Martin Luther King Jr. remains one of the great moral and political philosophers in history. And today, you're in for a treat. I want to thank Associate Provost Allison Williams, who's always so gracious in giving everybody else credit. But, but I, I want to thank Allison, and I also want to thank our chaplain, Phoebe Myram, for the time they put into making this happen today. Can we give them a round of applause? I also want to thank Uba Patel and his team at the Interfaith Youth Corps, both for being here today. Um, I also want to thank you just for being a great friend of the college and for all you do in the world. And I want to acknowledge that you made a great hire a couple years ago when you hired a Denison alum. This day always seems important, um, but as I was reflecting over the weekend, this year, this day seems even more important. And it does so for two reasons. The first is this country and the world at large needs the words and wisdom of Dr. King. In so many ways, in so many contexts, in so many places, the last year has reminded us of our need to deal with issues of race. We need more open conversations. We need more ways to grapple with, to understand, and to make progress on issues of race. It is a legacy that we've inherited, and we need to be the ones to deal with it in an open, transparent, and forward-looking way. Dr. King once said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Second, um, I think we have a tremendous opportunity on this campus, at this historical moment, to make a Denison a college that others talk about because we've become a campus that embraces social inclusion and respect as a defining value and core strength. Over the last 20 years, Denison has become a more diverse place. Our students, faculty, and staff bring a wide array of views, perspectives, and experiences to campus. This makes us a healthier, more interesting, relevant, and vibrant college. But now we all need to step into a space together to do the hard work of being a college community that sees diversity as a source of strength. We need to be a community where every member feels valued, listened to, and respected. To be a community where people seek out those whose life experiences are different from their own because we come to see diversity as interesting and fun and we seek to build organizations and friendship groups that represent the diversity of our college. We have work to do to get to this place. I'm inspired by all the students, faculty, and staff on campus who are doing this work. And I want to take today as a moment to ask every single member of this community to step into that space. 
That is one legacy of Dr. King, who once said, people fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they've not communicated with each other. That is the spirit of this event today. I'm proud to introduce Ibu Patel, founder and president of the Interfaith Youth Corps. Ibu is a leading voice in the movement for interfaith cooperation and the founder and president of Interfaith Youth Corps, a nonprofit working to make interfaith cooperation a social norm. He is the author of Acts of Faith, Sacred Ground, and Interfaith Leadership. He was named by US News and World Report as one of America's best leaders of 2009. Ibu served on President Obama's inaugural Faith Council. He is a regular contributor to public conversations around religion in America and a frequent speaker on the topic of religious pluralism. He holds a doctorate in sociology of religion from Oxford University where he studied on a Rhodes Scholarship. For over 15 years, Ibu has worked with governments, social sector organization, and colleges and university campuses to help realize a future where religion is a bridge of cooperation rather than a barrier of division. These days, Ibu spends most of his time on the road doing what he loves, meeting students, educators, and community leaders to talk about the complex landscape of religious diversity and the power of interfaith cooperation in the 21st century. He once said, to see the other side, to defend the other person, not despite your tradition, but because of it, is the heart of pluralism. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Ibu Patel. I was 19 years old once also, and after a two-paragraph introduction, here's what I would have been thinking. Boy, that guy better not be boring. <laughs> so I want to present something of a different take on Martin Luther King Jr. today. Uh, he is many, many things. He is, I think, the greatest American hero of the 20th century. He's an African-American icon, a paragon of nonviolence. I want to look at the part of Martin Luther King Jr. that is a faith hero a Christian hero, and an interfaith leader. I want to begin with a quote from the scholar Jaroslav Pelikan, who once said that tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. In the first part of this talk, I want to focus on Martin Luther King Jr. as an exemplar of tradition of faith tradition, of Christian tradition. And I want to suggest that what makes King's Christian faith tradition distinctive, which is part of what made him such a hero, was the way that he allowed it to be open to interaction and cooperation with other traditions. Let's remember that King was a prince of the black church. His daddy was a preacher. His granddaddy was a preacher. His great-granddaddy was a preacher. He was basically nurtured at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, went to a black Baptist college, Morehouse. In the late 1940s, he finally came north to a seminary in Pennsylvania called Crozier. And when he was at Crozier, he got wind in the year 1950 that a great black intellectual was coming to Philadelphia to a place called Friendship House to give a talk on Christian love. So this young seminary student, 20, 21 years old, about the age of many of you in this room, takes the train to Philadelphia, sits in the back of that hall, and listens to the president of Howard University, Mordecai Johnson, give a talk on the topic of Christian love in which he uses as the exemplar of that ethos the example of a Hindu from India. Mahatma Gandhi, says Mordecai Johnson, could teach just about every Christian in the world a thing or two 
about Christian love. Now let's think for a moment. What must young Martin Luther King Jr. have been thinking at this time? It's not like he hadn't heard of Gandhi, right? Gandhi was the great moral figure in many ways of the 1940s. Benjamin Mays, the president of Morehouse College, would occasionally make reference to him. But this notion that Gandhi exemplified what was highest and best in Christianity, I mean, think for a moment how shocking that must be to a young seminary student who saw himself as a pastor, as a prince of the black church. I mean, frankly, putting myself in King's shoes at the time, I wouldn't have blamed him if he simply stood up, turned around, and walked out of the lecture hall. Who wants to hear that their own tradition, the vocation of their fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers, is best exemplified by somebody who is not principally nurtured on the Bible, but the Bhagavad Gita. So this is where I want us to begin our journey with King. That he actually wasn't afraid of what Gandhi's Hindu expression of nonviolence would mean for his Christian faith. He was actually principally curious. He had long viewed the ethic of nonviolence is something that you did primarily with friends and family. If you want to run a nation, if you want to have a social movement, you got to be pragmatic like everybody else. Well, Gandhi, nurtured by the Bhagavad Gita and not the Bible, showed him something different. King says that he went out that night and bought a half dozen books on the Mahatma. Been dead for two years, killed by a zealot from his own tradition. But King wanted to know something of the texture and fiber of this man. I have this image of King back in the library at Crozier, a stack of books on Christianity on his left, Tillich and Niebuhr and Rosenbusch and the Bible, and the stack of biographies of Gandhi on his right, and he's reading across these traditions, and he's asking himself the question, what is it in this man's Hindu faith that could make me a better Christian? Tradition. It's the living faith of the dead, not the dead faith of the living. King is so taken by the example of Gandhi that in 1959, four years after the Montgomery bus boycott, where he was able to practice Gandhi in a movement in which he said, we're building the beloved community. King goes to India. He's a guest of the Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, one of Gandhi's acolytes. He wants to see the legacy of Gandhi up close and personal with his own eyes. And what shocks him more than anything is that Gandhi's Satyagraha movement, his love force movement, was not just Hindus. There were Buddhists and Muslims and Jains Hindus of all stripes, deep Orthodox believers and practitioners and secular Hindus like Nehru. There were people from indigenous traditions in India. There were Christians. King is blown away by what Gandhi was able to inspire. He comes back to his pulpit in Montgomery, Alabama, the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And on Palm Sunday, he gives a sermon whose second to last line is this, O oh God, our gracious Heavenly Father, we call you this name. We know some call you Allah. We know some call you Brahma. We know some call you Elohim. We know some call you the unmoved mover. This prince of the black church is growing some interfaith wings. So, I think it is an entirely legitimate question to ask. As you grow your wings in cooperation with other traditions, what of your roots? So King, in this respect also, I think, is an exemplar. I said just now that the second to last line in this sermon is about the different names that people call God. 
The last line is this. Who will come to the front of the church and take Jesus as their Lord and Savior? King spreads his inner faith wings. And as he does it, somehow, remarkably, he is growing deeper his own Christian roots. He ends an interfaith sermon with an altar call to Christianity. And I don't think he sees these as opposing at all. In fact, I think that he sees these things as entirely continuous. It is precisely because he is a deeply rooted Christian that he is in profound conversation with people from other religious traditions. Even when those other traditions challenge him in extremely uncomfortable ways. In 1965, King begins a correspondence with the great Buddhist monk from Vietnam, the venerable Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich Nhat Hanh writes to King, Dear Dr. King, we Buddhists of Vietnam, we regard you as a bodhisattva, as one who has attained enlightenment and could choose to enter into the state of nirvana and instead has decided to stay on earth and teach compassion to his fellow human beings. Dr. King, does your compassion not extend to those of us suffering in Vietnam? It is a profound challenge to something that Dr. King is deeply uncomfortable with, which is at a time of the growing success of the Civil Rights Movement, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 1965, he understands the Vietnam War as a problem, but he has been reticent speaking out about it. That correspondence with Thich Nhat Hanh is what brings him to Riverside Church on April 4th, 1967. To say that the supreme unifying force of life is that great secret found in the traditions of Christianity and Islam and Judaism and Hinduism and Buddhism. That love is the thread that binds us all. And that he is here to say that that love should extend to how this nation treats people in other countries. Dr. King, the Christian with deep roots, the interfaith leader with wide wings, a tradition in interaction with other traditions, a set of eyes that saw beyond. As I was putting this talk together, I realized that I have made the mistake that I think that many others make about Martin Luther King Jr., which is that we think his leadership is principally about what happened to him, the ways that his Christian tradition, the ways that his American identity interacted with others, the way he absorbed from the various parts of the world. But actually, leadership is not principally about what happens to somebody. It's not even principally about what that individual does. It's principally about what other people do. The definition of a leader is somebody who inspires participation and points it in the right direction. And I guess for as much as I have read about and loved and studied Martin Luther King Jr. in books, it, it just didn't come alive for me the way that it did on August 2nd, 2016, when I brought my family, my wife, and my two young sons at the time, eight and five, to the first permanent memorial erected to Martin Luther King Jr. in the city of Chicago. It's the 50th anniversary of his March for Fair Housing in Chicago in 1966. Perhaps you haven't heard of that because, well, it's not as clean 
and inspiring as, say, the March on Washington. It's an ugly moment in the history of my city and in the history of this country. King shows up at the invitation of Archbishop Cody of the Catholic Archdiocese. He has 700 peaceful marchers in the city of Chicago. They are outnumbered, eight to one, by the people from that neighborhood who come out on their porches and yell and jeer and scream the ugliest names that you could think of and throw bricks and bottles. One hits Martin Luther King Jr. in the head. He goes down on one knee, wipes the blood away, gets up, keeps walking. That's what happened in Chicago on August 2nd, 1966. So why commemorate that moment? Because that's not all that happened. A young Carol Mosley Braun, who would go on to be the first black woman in the Senate, was told by her mother if there was one place she was not to go that day when she was 18 years old, it was Marquette Park, to be with Dr. King. Well, ever tried to tell an 18 year old what to do? So there's young Carol Mosley Braun watching King get hit by a brick, go down on a knee and saying, this is my fight now. This is my fight now. Operation Breadbasket starts that day. Harold Washington for mayor starts that day. Barack Obama for president starts that day. King inspires a scene whose exterior is all ugliness. But there is much moving in the interior. There are many people watching saying, this is my fight now. Amongst them was a Jewish rabbi named Robert, Rabbi Robert Marx. He was sent there as an observer from the Reform Synagogues of Chicago. And he says later, standing on the sidewalk, watching what is happening in the street, I just thought to myself, I am on the wrong side. To be an observer is to be on the wrong side. The people who put together that commemoration, that march on August 2nd, 2016, the people who erected the first permanent memorial to Martin Luther King Jr. in the city of Chicago, 50 years after he marched in Marquette Park, is a group called the Inner City Muslim Action Network. This Muslim organization started by a handful of 19-year-olds when they were in college who decide that their tradition of Islam, as it is mixing with the currents of the time, everything from urban redevelopment to hip-hop, as they're watching their Christian and their Jewish friends become involved in ground-level social action, they're thinking to themselves, being Muslim doesn't just mean praying in the masjid. It means building community in Marquette Park. And as Rami Nashashibi and his crew continue to build there and learn the history of that neighborhood, they think to themselves, our Muslim tradition connects with what Archbishop Cody and Martin Luther King Jr. were doing here 50 years before. So don't ask us why a Muslim group would be the first group to erect the first permanent memorial to Martin Luther King Jr. in the city of Chicago. Our tradition is informed by his tradition. 
Our Islam is in part a reflection of what he taught us. Do you think that we would exist, that our parents would even have come here if it wasn't for how he opened up the landscape? We owe this to him. Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Not the dead faith of some people who are living. Tradition is the way that our inheritances interact with the inheritances of other people and move towards what is hopefully a more collective and cooperative discovery. One final thing. You know, it's funny, Cornel West sometimes says that he has to get out of the United States every January because he just cannot take the Santa Clausification of Martin Luther King Jr. Just can't deal with it. I think that there is a danger to that, right? A danger to making this man safe and cuddly. I think the danger is to think that he's just otherworldly. And if we just chant his name loud enough, maybe God will send us somebody else like him. It's a story of two civil rights workers sitting in a cafe. And one says, you know, all you hear about these days in the press is Martin Luther King Jr. this and Martin Luther King Jr. that. Don't these folks in the media know what we do? How much work we put in? And his friend says, don't you know that our name is Martin Luther King Jr.? A leader is defined not principally about what happens to him or her, or even what he or she does. A leader is defined principally by how he or she inspires the participation of other people and points them in the right direction. In that tradition, our name is Martin Luther King Jr. and his name is America. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu. Ibu gives us a fabulous backdrop of traditions engaging one another. And we thought today's day would be incomplete if we didn't have an opportunity to show you that on stage. So we're gonna welcome two more to stage and you're gonna learn a little bit more about them in their, um, in their discussion. So I'll keep it brief, but we're gonna welcome Rashad Moore to stage and Reka Prasad. And as they get their mics on and turn them on and sit in their seats, I'll say Reka directs mindfulness efforts at NYU. She's a practicing Buddhist. Rashad is a reverend in the Baptist Church and is an assistant minister at Abyssinian Baptist in New York City. Without further, further ado, conversation with the three of them. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to first thank Ibu for such a moving, moving, inspirational message on interfaith dialogue and grappling with reality, but also the legacy of Dr. King in a way that we will not set to classify him. For our discussion today, I want to make sure that we ground our reflections in our own personal experience that will relieve us the pressure of having to speak on behalf of an entire tradition that we all don't agree with. And so I want to begin this afternoon by sharing with you all in this conversation. Again, Jackie was, un was not able to be with us this afternoon, and so we're going to riff 
on Ebu's conversation, we can ask each other questions as well. I want to first begin with Rick and Ebu asking, how does your faith or spiritual tradition inform your approach to social activism? Excuse me. Hi, everyone. Um, so, you know, my, my journey's been an interesting one. I grew up a Hindu and uh, then transitioned into sort of more of a Buddhist practice. But I remember one of the earliest formations of my understanding of God, and this has a, um, an outcome that will answer the question. Um, but, you know, I was sitting in my room, and my mother, she's a very pretty lady, and she was, I was probably about four, so we're talking almost 40 years ago. Um, and I was watching her as she prayed, and she did uh, the puja. Um, talk about interface, she's now Jehovah's Witness. That's another story. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, that's a whole other story. But, um, so I was watching her and I sort of said, you know, Mommy, what are you doing? And she said, I'm praying to God. And I said, what's God? And she said, close your eyes, put your hand on your heart, and put your hand out there. That's God. So that's been sort of forming my understanding of God since I was three or four years old. And and really for me, what that's meant over the years is, uh, you know, ultimately the interrelational dynamic of everything, the interconnectedness of everything and everyone. And, you know, I abandoned that when I became a teenager and in my college years, your age, because um, I was super angry about everything. Um, you name it, I probably could have been angry about it. And then eventually realized that was exhausting and decided to find a different way. And so my Buddhist tradition really came from a place of needing some like tools, some actual tools to help me find greater ease with my life, how to figure it out. And the main principles of Buddhist practice is really just the understanding that what is here is also out here, right? So it's that connection and understanding that the path to my freedom didn't lay outward, didn't lay out in an external framework or a place that was uh, telling me something about myself based on the shell that I was born in, that really freedom lay within me. So whatever the barriers in my heart toward that freedom, which really included looking at everyone around me as I see myself, then that's my work to do. And through that space, I can enter social justice movements, I can enter a want for a better world um, from a place of love and compassion, which is, let me tell you, way more energizing than the anger um, and more sustainable. And I know that sounds like it's kind of easy and naive, but it's really not. It actually takes a lot of work um, to stay in that place and a daily practice. I, I tell the story that the Dalai Lama every morning gets up and cultivates his loving kindness practice his metta practice, where he has to set the intention to love his fellow man and woman. So, I don't know if that quite answers the question, but that's kind of the, the evolution of my own faith, and then I could come back to my own place within the larger movement from a more authentic and loving place that was really grounded in who I was and in self-reflection. Thank you for that. Um, so, you open by saying, we probably don't agree with the entirety of all of the traditions we're from, right? right. And that's probably true, right? <laughs> um, in part because the, the traditions are wide and self, you know, there's 1.6 billion Muslims on the planet right now. They live in dozens and dozens of countries, and it's been a tradition that's existed for for 1400 years, right? So there are likely to be not only an infinite dimension of elements, but a whole set of those that are, that are in opposition to each other, right? Um, so one of the ways that I find it useful to connect with the tradition is to ask the question, what are the stories that I connect most deeply with, right? So, and actually there's the, the, the great uh, comparative religion scholar, Wilford Cantwell Smith said, this is actually what the definition of faith is, right? The definition of faith is the relationship that any particular believer or set of believers has with a tradition. So in the infinite tradition that is Islam, what are the stories or practices uh, or dimensions of doctrine that I, that I connect most deeply with, right? It's a separate question to say, are there, are there some dimensions that are, that are necessary for calling oneself a Muslim, some dimensions that are kind of first order, 
and, and others that are that that one can that are more optional. That's that's something of a different discussion, right? But I, I think it's important to bring up. Uh, um, I don't think that I don't think that we invent traditions. I do think that we choose how we relate to them, right? So, a story that has been really important to me in the tradition of Islam uh, um, is a story under the kind of ethical rubric of mercy, right? So, uh, uh, Rama is is or mercy is is the chief value in Islam. You might not learn that if the only thing you know about Islam is what you see on the evening news, um, but it's actually it's actually uh, um, a well-defined scholarly view that mercy is the chief value in the tradition. So uh, in the Quran it says, for example, that uh, God says to the Prophet Muhammad, we sent you to be nothing but a special mercy upon all the worlds. Ramatul alamin special mercy upon all the worlds. Classical Muslim scholars, the, the first lesson that they would teach their students is if you are merciful to those on earth, then the one who is in heaven will be merciful to you, right? So th this, you know, as I was reconnecting with Islam in my early 20s, that was really inspiring to me, right? What does it mean to be, to be merciful? And there's a story in the life of the prophet which for me just embodied this. So. This is uh, towards the end of, end of the prophet's life. I think it's the year 630 or the year 631. Uh, he is leading uh, his community in Medina back to Mecca to do either the Hajj or the Umrah, one of the, one of the, uh, uh, one of the holy rites of the circumambulations around the Kaaba. And you can imagine like this massive caravan, right? Hundreds of people, many, many camels, all, kind, all of the things you would need to make a major journey from Medina to Mecca in the year 630 or 631. So the prophet looks ahead and can see some miles ahead that there's a dog and her pups right in the road that the caravan is taking. And he knows that the caravan is gonna crush this, this, this litter. And I would just think most people would be like, look, you know, we've, there's like a thousand of us here, that's, that's collateral damage. Right? It just, just happens. Sorry. But not, not, not the prophet of mercy. He shifts the course of the caravan so that this dog and her pups would not be disturbed. He doesn't even send somebody up to try to move the dog and her pups. And he decides that that is life being nurtured right there and that he's going to be reverent of it. And I just find that so beautiful, right? There's this, there's this beautiful line uh, in the Jewish tradition. Um, I, I, don't, I don't go to this rabbi to study Torah. I go to see how the rabbi ties his shoes, right? Like I'm interested in how this, the Holy One does the smallest things because that's, that is how mercy is expressed. And so for me, that story was really moving when I first read it. The reason why I wanted to begin with the question of our own approach to social activism from our own experience is because, indeed, I believe that we don't all agree with our entire traditions. And for me, as an African-American who is an ordained Baptist minister, a graduate of Morehouse, where Dr. King attended, I also realized that my approach to my faith tradition is not the same as many people in America, that my ancestors came to Christianity from a slave ship, that Christianity was introduced to many blacks for the sense of remaining subservient. But yet out of my own faith tradition, I am amazed by ancestors who took a faith that was made to oppress them to set themselves free. That's a very unique and different expression of Christianity than what I see on the shelves of Barnes and Noble in any given city. The reason why I come from that perspective is because my approach as a black person, as a black man to Christianity is always with a question mark. And I think that a part of what it means to be faithful is also to have questions. I heard someone say that the best gift that you can give, as Evil said earlier, that tradition is not the faith, the dead faith of the living, but it's, a, it's say that one more time. I'm going to see if I get this right. Okay. I had to practice it 11 times before I so. It is the living. Tradition is the living faith of the dead. 
and not the dead faith of the living. Someone once told me that the best gift that you can give to your tradition is the gift of your questions. And I believe that I've learned that from the Jewish tradition. So even when we look back as we begin to have this interfaith dialogue, one of the questions that I'm bringing to this conversation is, as we approach the other, how do we from our own faith traditions hold our traditions accountable? In the sense that we talk about Gandhi and Gandhi's influence on King, but yet when we mention the influence of Gandhi on King, we still then have to raise the question about misogyny. That when we talk about King's faithfulness and commitment to the Christian tradition, we also have to ask the question about, well, when Thich Nhat Hanh called on Dr. King to raise a voice about Vietnam, King was also going against some of his own friends who said, Lyndon Johnson gave you the Civil Rights Bill, just be happy. But King's commitment to his faith caused him to even turn away from his friends who thought that that was going too far. So my question to the both of you as we continue the dialogue is, as a Buddhist, Muslim, Christian, how do we hold our own faith traditions accountable? How do we give to our own traditions that question mark? Because without the question mark, we veer closer to the side of being extremists or fundamentalists, and it says that we become so locked down to what we believe that we don't hold it loosely enough to grow and make it our own. Oh, great. I'm the first person to answer that. <laughs> so I would say from, the, from my perspective at least, and that's the one I'm always speaking of um, from that vantage point, you know, intersectionality is a big deal. I don't even think that the language around it was there for most people. Um, so how do I approach my Buddhism? Well, you know, the reality is, and, and I, I look at Buddhism and mindfulness practice as empowerment tools. Um, ultimately, it's about understanding my conditioning. So again, what am I buying into in a narrative about how somebody sees me? So if there is, if I'm getting heated because there's somebody who looks at me and puts me in a box based on, again, this body, the shell, it's because some part of me believes it and understands it to be so. So again, that turns, I have to turn inward. That doesn't mean that I don't understand what's happening externally. So this shows up in American Buddhism all the time. Like Buddhism, like any other tradition, like you both have said, has changed and evolved depending on what culture it hits and all the various things that are happening at the time. I mean, the Buddha himself was reacting to a Hindu caste system um, and a very hierarchical, patriarchal world. And he himself, there are all sorts of issues when we talk about um, gender in the Buddhist tradition and in its roots, and how the nuns were treated differently, etc. So I think we, we see the, the impact of that all the time, right? Um, American Buddhism and you know, Western Buddhism, which is primarily obviously how I practice since I'm here, um, has gone through a lot of interesting conversations recently because it's sort of being pushed around this notion of oh, in Buddhist practice, there is no separation, there's no difference between us, so why are we even talking about that? So as, as soon as you talk about difference or intersectionality, you're out of the Buddhist practice, you're out of the principle of um, uh, interconnectedness. When that doesn't quite work, right? So part of it is a bunch of people in the movement saying, but wait a second, before I can even come to this understanding of interconnection and seeing you as me, I have to look at the ways in which we don't see that right now and the impact of that. I have to look at all the ways in which there is the separation first because that's the reality. And in truth, Buddhism is really being about the actual reality of things. So if I'm resisting it, if I'm not understanding it, if I'm trying to avoid it, that is actually against Buddhist principles, against whatever that means. So I think the idea is really, there's been a movement, uh, especially amongst people of color within the Buddhist practice in the American tradition, uh, to sort of say, whoa, we are doing some major spiritual bypass here. We're saying that we're gonna meditate, and once you meditate, you understand there's non-self. And so we're bypassing all the ways in which this self that I am in is causing me suffering, and all the causes and conditioning of that suffering. And if we ignore that as a community, 
we're actually not bringing the principles of love and compassion to the ways we are with one another, we're actually ignoring the causes and conditions of suffering for people, and therefore cannot actually walk this path together. So that in and of itself is causing an exclusivity, ironically. The idea that we're all one somehow becomes this way in which we bypass the reality of, of the fact that we don't see each other that way and all the consequences and impact of that on various people trying to be of this tradition. So we have to be able to not blindly follow things or, you know, and, and you and I were talking about this recently, you know, part of me is not a big fan of um, putting anybody on a pedestal, even the Dalai Lama, who I love, or Thich Nhat Hanh, who I'm, whom I'm also a big fan of, um, or any teacher for that matter, because it becomes something where we miss out on all the opportunities to see that the teacher is right here, in every moment, in every opportunity, in every body. Um, and that teaching is gonna look different based on that body and that subjective experience. And so much of what I can learn and grow spiritually in my own self is understanding how you experience this life in this body. So I miss out on the opportunity if I say, it just looks like this because this is the embodiment of, of, how, it, of how it is. So I was, I was joking, I mean, I wasn't joking actually, I was dead serious about RuPaul, right? Yeah, good. The other day I was watching an interview with RuPaul, who I love, RuPaul is, you know, drag race fans out there, I'm sure. So RuPaul says, one of his quoted lines is, we're born naked and the rest is drag. Now, I cannot think of a more spiritually minded thing to say than that, right? Like, but if I'm caught up with every, you know, not being able to see the, the embodiment of spirituality and the practice in all these living people walking around, in all these different experiences and bodies, and I'm saying, no, only this is okay in my tradition. I can only learn from this one set of principles. That it's not fluid in moments where it can show up in RuPaul. Then I am, I think, missing the whole point of being these spiritual beings in human bodies. So for me, it's really about how do we bring all these voices and these experiences to further our own spiritual journey as opposed to narrowing it. I'm all, like, Buddhism is all about walking into any moment with a don't know mind and saying, anything is possible. You can be anything right now in front of me. I'm not gonna bring all my conditioning into this experience. I'm gonna open up the possibility that you in this body can be anything that you wanna be. I don't determine that for you. So it's the same with spirituality. I, I can open up to God speaking to me, and I believe in God, speaking to me in, in any body. Thank you. So generally speaking, you know, I, I don't think traditions last for 500 or 1,000 or 1,500 years and that they spread over continents and that new people take them up and, uh, and mix them with their own cultural expressions unless, unless huge dimensions of those traditions are life-giving, right? And unless there are mechanisms built into those traditions which allow for precisely what you're saying, right? Uh, um, as more people of color be, take on Buddhist practice, American Buddhism is going to change. Right, it, it, it is going to, uh, it's going to absorb some of the experience and expressions and concerns of its new participants. And from my limited knowledge of Buddhism, my sense is that's, that is woven into the tradition. That doesn't mean that the arguments now are not heated. It just means that when, when it's looked at a hundred years from now, People will say, oh, and then this Buddhist movement emerges, which does X, Y, and Z, and in ten, 10 years after that, it's not called a Buddhist movement, it's just called Buddhism, right? It's just woven into the tradition. And that is in part because the tradition has mechanisms for that. And again, that doesn't mean that in the time that it happens, there isn't significant tension and argument and heat and et cetera, right? Um, so, my concern right now, actually, is uh, it, I don't want to hold myself up 
as more evolved than the wisdom of a 1,400-year-old tradition called Islam and suggest that I can, uh, uh, sta standing from a pedestal, ask it questions, right? Yeah. That doesn't mean don't inquire. Got it. it just means, I think, inquire gently, mm -hmm. with love, right? Expecting that if something has lasted 1,400 years and it's life-giving, at least significant dimensions of it are, that there are mechanisms which will welcome the inquiry. And if door one doesn't, there's a thousand other doors, right? The reason that so many African Americans, so long after the Civil War segregation, continue to call themselves Christian is because there are elements and dimensions of the Christian tradition which allow for different movements, which, which have questioned and changed and widened and altered other dimensions, right? And I think that that is part of these things being great tradition, right? And when I say great, I do not always, I do not mean every dimension is good. I, do not, I don't mean that everything ought to be taken as received. I only mean inquire gently, right? inquire gently. Otherwise, we run the risk of thinking that, and I have, you know, not having not only run this risk, but like run this risk headlong into the wall several times, that I am the most evolved person I know and justified in looking at everybody else and asking them questions, as opposed to thinking, I am a product of these many things. And part of being that product means that I am left with a set of inquiries, which I will ask of these many things how this came about. And in that process, I will probably be the one who gains the most improvement, and perhaps there will be some widening in these entities as well. Good. Thank you. So I also want to take the point of privilege to say that I am a, I guess I could say a proud graduate, right? Heck yeah, man. A proud graduate of IFYC. Having gone to the ILI training a couple of you know years ago while I was in college, and I remember that experience because we were in Chicago and a bunch of us college students on a summer day, summer weekend, um, talking about interfaith dialogue, and then we got pretty annoyed after it because it's like, well, how does this all work? What does it look like, right? So that night we actually ventured off into Chicago and got lost, and it was too late, and the train stopped running. And <laughs> that's what, really late. <laughs> Chicago, that's right. like New York three, City, three and five a.m. There we go. <laughs> and so what we learned from that was actually what the experience that we was what we were looking for in the workshop is we were making it happen just organically. And from that experience, I formed friendships with people across religious differences because we met at IFYC. And so I, th that leads me to my second, my, my third question, which is we're talking about interfaith dialogue, interreligious engagement on a college campus. And the question is, how do we sustain these experiences after this moment? So on a campus, we, we do it on a daily basis. So what does it look like as graduates, 10 years out, five years away from, uh, from college? How do we sustain this commitment to the dialogue across differences? First of all, do we not have curfews at these things? I mean, who we'll let this guy sneak out at midnight? And we, you were, we held it in River Forest for a reason. But we were, but we were better together. <laughs> yeah, right. So there were 11 of you, 11 of you on the red line platform at 3 a.m. Yeah, great. <laughs> better together. Everybody's like, where do I sign up? Uh, I love it. Better together. So th thank you for that. I, I love that. First of all, I love that story. I love, I, I love that. Insight. But by the way, you know, I, it, is not, it is not incidental that Martin Luther King Jr. Goes, goes to see Mordecai Johnson when he is 21 and on a, a university campus and has changed, right? Like, he could have gone to that same speech four years later and said, good speech, I got a sermon to write. There is something really special, really, really, really special about being at a residential institution of higher education where ideas are just floating everywhere, where people are throwing things up into the universe, and every once in a while you run smack into it and it just changes your life, right? It, it, it just, it's really, really special, right? Part of it is that 
you can come out of Sociology of Religions 300, where you learn about you know, the history of interfaith movements in America, and you think, wow, who, who, who knew that, that Judeo-Christian wasn't a term written into the Declaration of Independence, and instead, it was a term that was invented in the 1930s as a way of including Jews and Catholics in the American family. That's so inspiring. Maybe we should do some interfaith stuff here at Denison. And you walk five minutes across the quad to the chaplaincy or to the student affairs building, and you're like, I'd like to start an interfaith group. And there's somebody there, Phoebe, who's like, well, let's do it, right? I mean, there's, there are not that many other places on earth where you can, like, in an 11 o'clock session, be learning profound historical knowledge, and then an hour later be starting an organization that is looking to put that knowledge into action in a contemporary setting. So actually, like six months after I graduated college, I'm, you know, I'm living in Chicago, I have my first job, I have this moment where I'm feeling like extremely forlorn and like existentially uncomfortable. And I'm like, what is going on? And I finally put my finger on it. I'm like, where are all the people telling me how great I am? <laughs> and I hate to say this, you really smart college students out there, Phoebe, Allison, Adam, all these people, that's part of what they're paid to do. <laughs> they, are, they are paid to tell you, wow, that's such a brilliant idea. Why, why don't you write your senior thesis on that? Yes, I will stay an hour extra at office hours next Thursday, and, and we will work, we'll work on it together. And then when you graduate college, they're not like next door anymore, right? And it's, it is extremely disconcerting. It is, it is extremely disconcerting. And that's when your college education really kicks in. Because it means, did their voices get inside you, right? Did your ability to acquire knowledge and to practice civic skills did you do it enough that now that you're in very different terrain, you're able to, to, to do it in that terrain, right? You, you, don't have, you don't have folks every 50 feet saying, yeah, let's try that out, or how could that work? By the way, it's, it's meant to be like this. This is one of the great geniuses of, of, of America, right? Our system of, of colleges is, is one of the jewels of our civilization in the United States. And part of the way that it's set up is to help young people try out new ideas, try out new skills precisely so that when they go out in the broader democracy, they've got the strength and the confidence to make that stuff happen, right? It's college is practice for the public, right? It's practice for the public. And so I love seeing you, right? And I love hearing the story of, of thinking like, you know, this, this Interfaith Leadership Institute is whack. Did you see that, that moderate guy, Ibu Patel, give his talk about evolution instead of revolution? Well, screw him. We're going to go to Chicago and like miss the train, right? Like, by the way, that was, that was how IFYC started. I was that dude when I was 20 at a conference at Stanford in 1998. I was like, who are these boring old people on panels? And now I am one of those boring old people <laughs> on a panel. And God willing, you know, you're like an exciting young person on the panel, but God willing, you'll be a boring old person. And some, some, some dude in the audience will be like, that dude is whack, I'm gonna go out and do this now. And then in 10 years, she will be here. The beauty is that it brought us together. And you're right, after graduation, the opportunity to be in a community with people who are so diverse is not the reality. Even if you live in New York, right? You're living in New York, maybe diverse, but you're not talking to people without walking down the street. But I'm also reminded of this, this quote that says that, never say that your mother's soup is the best if you have never left your village. Never say that your mother's soup is the best if you have never left your village. And I say that asking, from your experiences, how have you found your religious traditions or your own personal faith practices to be strengthened by your interfaith uh, relationships? As a Baptist minister serving in a historically black congregation in Harlem, I must admit that I, I don't pray seven times a day. 
Uh, I don't meditate every morning. But I found myself challenged towards self-care because of my, my relationships with people of other faiths. And so I'm asking, it's pretty much it's a selfish question, from our own standpoints, from our own practices, from our own traditions, how can we strengthen that, our commitments, by being in dialogue with other people? What have you learned in your own life from other religions? And you, you're also working on a college campus with college students. What are some of the practices that you hope to instill in your students across religious differences before they leave you after four years? Yeah, that's a big question. And I know we want to ask questions of the audience too, right? So I, do we have time to do that? A few minutes, okay. So I want to say that, you know, we're talking about a lot of these ideas, but let's talk about the practicality of it, right? Like, let's look at, like, I'm a Buddhist, super practical. You know, at the end of the day, what does it look like to be in front of somebody who does not share your viewpoint in the world, whatever that may be, and then talk to one another in a way that doesn't make you want to beat each other, right? Like, so how, how do we do that in a way that, from, a, from our intention and motivation? Really, what needs to happen is we need to learn skills. Like, I know it sounds really boring, but like, we need to learn how to communicate with each other. It's not just something that we were born into. I mean, it's something we're, we're taught, and often at times what I'm seeing with a lot of young people, because, so I run this uh, mindfulness program, Mindful NYU Meditation Yoga Med and uh, Mindfulness, through the Office of Global Spiritual Life, which I run one branch of it, and then the other branch is all about multi-faith and interfaith dialogue. That's what we do. It's called the Of Many Institute. And often at times, obviously, everything gets all mixed up. So this is, this is kind of what we do. We engage young people to talk across religious differences and faith-based differences. That includes humanists, that includes you know, secular spirituality, it includes everything. So, because one of the things we're finding too is that young people are identifying more and more on campuses as spiritual but not religious, right? So we also want to be inclusive of those voices on this stage as well, um, which I'm sure many of you, I don't know how many of you in the, in the audience identify that way. Is there just hand? Yeah, okay, so a lot of people, right? And so we want to be able to be sure that we're understanding who are we even in dialogue with. So there's a, a certain level of, again, curiosity that we, we have to bring to each of those conversations. So when you're facing somebody who's from a different faith, how do we not look at that person as a threat as opposed to somebody who is just in dialogue with us, right? How do we not feel threatened? Because the feeling of being threatened is, is derived from you. Whether or not, this person can have whatever experience and faith that they want and, and answers to those questions. But that doesn't necessarily have to have meaning for you unless you give it meaning. What are you associating with this person just having a different perspective in life? What is coming up in you that makes that threatening? So first we have to sit with ourselves. Again, I'm always gonna bring it back there. Sorry, I'm also a family therapist, so that's gonna come back in, into this too. But what is, what is arising in you that is putting something on somebody else who is just different in whatever way, even if they're trying to persuade you. Trust me, I'm Hindu. I grew up with people coming up to me all the time trying to tell me all sorts of things about heaven and hell and where I was going and all sorts of stuff. And after a while, I, it didn't get me upset because it was one of those things where I could see, oh wow, this person really is worried for my soul. Wow. You know, and I could take it that way because it didn't affect my own perspective in the world. I was able to sit grounded in my own understanding to the point where it was authentic to who I was and was unshakable in a lot of ways. Didn't mean it can't grow and evolve, but the, the foundation of it was unshakable because I didn't see it as a threat. I just saw it as this person having their experience of being in the world and being truly worried for me. And that is such an immense shift in how you look at dialogue, right? How do we look at one another and say, I'm not trying to convince you of something. I'm trying to share my experience of it with you. That's a, that's a radical difference, right? So you have to be able to look at that and say, okay, do I, why do I need this person to believe something right now? What, what, what is it about that's happening in me that makes me need it from this person? Because that's, again, that's gonna come back to the self. So I think the way we approach it is really from this perspective of, of, of multifold. And one of it is really saying, what are our human experiences? 
one of the things of, of Buddhism that's so beautiful is that, and kind of depressing, but beautiful is that we're all going to suffer, right? I'm sorry to, to burst your bubble if you thought that wasn't going to happen. You're going to experience suffering if you haven't already and if you ha you're a college student, so you've suffered. Um, so the idea is we share that all in common, right? How do we understand our humanity just as just as the fact that we're born as, as human beings on this earth, we're going to share certain things. So how do we understand ourselves through those shared experiences? And then, through that connection, how do we then see our differences as something that's just a beautiful addition to all those things that we foundationally shared to each other? So we have kids come together and go bowling. You know, like, we have kids come together and teach each other. We have kids come together and just, you know, share food, culture, all sorts of things. And I know that's like, oh, it's cheesy where it goes, you know, whatever. But it really makes a difference because it really has a certain understanding of, oh, this person has, you know, their grandmother is crazy too. She, she you know, like, oh, so-and-so's mother is, you know, a nightmare as well. Or, you know, like through the suffering, right? So it's, it's one of those things where we can share all those things no matter what our, our backgrounds are and... I'm a Buddhist, you're a Muslim, you're a Christian, you're an atheist, and yet how do we share all these experiences together? So that was a lot. I know we want to switch to Q&A, but I don't know if you want to answer either of you that. Yeah, I just want to underscore one of the things you said, which I love, which is, you know, if, and I have been this guy way more times than I can count. But if, if I am such a proponent of diversity, why am I so rudely insistent on you thinking just like me? Isn't your thinking differently? Isn't that a constituent element of diversity? Look, I, I, I don't want you to be a neo-Nazi, right? I don't, I don't know any neo-Nazis, just to be clear here, right? But the point that I'm making is, if I am a proponent of diversity work, then the goal is relationship. It's not sameness. Everyone in the world is not going to be Christian. No. Everyone in the world is not going to be religious. And learning how to live together at the same table is the beauty of the God. Can we give them a big round of applause? <laughs>